can you hear me okay today we have gathered here to embark on a significant journey the journey that revolves around betterment of our communities and the promises through community benefits program in large government investments such as infrastructure projects this endeavor is about transformation economic growth and most importantly the well-being of communities that we call home the finch west lrt project is not just a construction initiative it's a lifeline connecting communities aspirations and opportunities it is also important to recognize that successful community benefits initiatives and programs requires careful planning foresight and genuine commitment to engagement now let's dive into the approaches and neighborhoods ensuring that the awareness about community benefits programs and the job opportunities through these community benefits programs are built into our community so they know what is happening and there is an opportunity to find employment through these community benefits programs we also heavily invest on retention and training for existing employees we provide environmental benefits we seek out and invest in local social enterprises and local businesses and businesses owned by equity deserving groups we are also always streamlining processes and systems and recently we have streamlined our process to monitor and track that has resulted in ample uh, opportunity and the advantage to see how we are doing so that we can keep on improving our processes Okay. I talked about community organization collaboration with community organization this is a prime example of one of a kind program that we put together at Finch West LRT project we called this the community internship program we executed this in partnership with Toronto community benefits network and many other number of employment serving agencies who came together to identify skilled immigrants who are willing to get into construction sector who have been job searching for a long time and they haven't had the opportunity to get into the sector so we came together and put two different uh, cohorts of internship program where we hired 18 highly qualified skilled immigrants who had ample of experience from their home country but never have worked in canada out of these 18 interns we were able to place 14 of them in successful employment almost two of them were employed with our large uh, subcontractors and the rest were all employed at mosaic transit group working with the finch west lrt project now these are permanent jobs these are permanent full time jobs they are not um, contract jobs so you could see the effect of communities coming together working with community organization this kind of um you know impact that you can make in these kind of programs so here we are looking at the key milestones of the project so far to date the trade highest has been 2225 out of which 12% percentage is apprentices 15% journey people and 73% laborers and helpers we have invested over 24.8 million dollars in community investment when i say community investment i mean local businesses and subcontractors and small businesses who are located around the finch west lrt construction corridor we have engaged over 250 community engagement and also initiatives we are continuously collaborating with our community partners and the neighborhoods and people to ensure that the projects update are provided on a regular basis the job opportunities in the project is uh, known for the community so that they know there is an opportunity to apply 20% plus of our highest are women and out of that 14% of them are in leadership positions I'm not sure how many of you know about the community benefits at Finch West LRT project. This is one of their pilot child and we only had 10% aspirational target at the Finch West LRT project. But I'm happy and proud to say that looking at a one year trend, you could see that we are at 21%.
we have consistently upheld this number by making sure that we are working with our community and subcontractors and job seekers to, to streamline their process into getting into the, you know, the, the construction sector. It is not an easy process. It's very difficult to get into construction sector. It's very difficult. Whether you are a trade person, you need to start from the bottom. If you are a professional, administrative, or technical person, you need to have experience. But we want to make sure we are taking out these barriers and ensuring that we provide the right support that's required for job seekers to enter and sustain their employment with us. And I also want to say, when we go out and talk about community benefits programs, it's we don't talk just about the Finch First LRT project. We talk about the construction career opportunities overall, right? So it's not just about one project. It's just the ample of opportunity and the labor shortage that's coming on a, on a rapid space at this time. So we need people. So we go out and talk about construction sector and shortage of labors in large. Next slide, please. I am so proud to be standing here to say that we are running an award-winning community benefits portfolio at Finch West LRT Project. We have been recognized by our stakeholders and our industry partners in various different occasions for the diversity and equity-related initiatives we have taken with the community. And also, we have been recognized as a leader in the community leading uh, diversity and equity-related um, initiatives and assisting the equity-deserving groups who are trying to get into job opportunities. Thank you. As you can see, these projects have the potential to create a better, more inclusive, and prosperous community for all. Building a project of this scale, like Finch West LRT project, is not just about laying tracks and erecting stations. It's about building bridges. Bridges that link neighborhoods, people, and hopes for a brighter future. Thank you. Thank you, Varney. What I take from that is, you know, we all say this term community benefits, but when you unpack what it means and you unpack the back office part, and Varney, you're part of that back office, it's about skills development, making sure that people from equity deserving communities have the skills, or if they don't have the skills to get trained for the skills. It's, so it's about labor force development. That's the big fancy word. It's about mentorship, making sure that everyone who's an apprentice or even a pre-apprentice has someone supporting them and encouraging them to get up at five o'clock in the morning, be at the job site at seven, making sure that they have all the supports to be uh, successful. And it's about knowing the local community, the local suppliers to make sure that they uh, are able to bid on everything from the nuts and bolts to the coffees, to the lunches, to the small supplies that people, people need. Thank you for your good work there, uh, Varney. Next, we have Beth, who's going to talk about the Great Canadian, I used to call it another name, but now it's called the Great Canadian Casino Resort Toronto. Beth, over. Saying um, and highlighting that the Rexdale CBA is special in the sense that it's the only separate community benefits agreement, agreement signed by the city of Toronto. Um, all other community benefits initiatives at the city are secured and enforced through city contracts. So for example, when the city buys, builds, or engages in um, lease agreements, where the Rexdale CBA was leveraged through opportunities that was available through the exp expanded gaming project at Casino Woodbine because of those requirements for municipal approval. So I just wanted to note um, that and just say that um, this definitely plays into the novelty and um, just the uniqueness of this agreement. And also, as you can imagine, uh, the amount of consideration that's gone into the development uh, and implementation of this specific CBA. 2023 also marks the fifth uh, year, fifth anniversary of the Rexdale CBA. So this is also a really great time to reflect on this journey. Next slide, please. So I'll just give a very uh, quick overview of the last five years, 2018. Uh, this is when the Rexdale CBA was signed by One Toronto Gaming in the city of Toronto, uh, which I'll review in the next slide, but um, it had 21 conditions. Um, and this was the year that launched a lot of the groundwork for the CBA and also when the construction uh, started for this project. 2019, I would attribute this year to a lot of the employment work for both employment operations and also construction employment. And there was really a push to develop uh, those hiring pathways that Varney was talking about as well for her project for both uh, local and equity deserving individuals. 
2020 and 2021. So those were very tough years for, for everyone. COVID hindered um, some of the key CBA initiatives that were in progress. And with those government mandated shutdowns, which led to a halt uh, in casino operations, it was, it was difficult. 2022, those shutdowns came to an end and the casino resumed its operations and the redevelopment continued, putting us back on track to deliver on CBA targets. And 2023, so this has been a really big year for all stakeholders involved with the Rexdale CBA. Uh, this year, we opened the doors of our new casino resort, including a 400-room hotel, new gaming floor, and three restaurants. And we will soon be opening a 5,000-person entertainment venue um, later this year. Although the project isn't complete, I just wanted to say that the work that preceded to make the opening happen this year uh, is something that was definitely celebrated by everyone involved. Next slide, please. So I'm going to highlight just a few of the targets outlined in the Rexdale CBA. This isn't everything, but just some of the key um, and those larger initiatives. So employment operations. Um, there was a target there for 40% of the hires to identify as either local or equity deserving. And local in this context for the Rexdale CBA is that seven kilometer radius surrounding the casino. Uh, employment construction, so 10% of hires to uh, identify as, again, either local or equity deserving. There was a target to develop a child care center in the local area. Community access to space, so creating a policy for the local community to access uh, that great Canadian Toronto entertainment venue that I spoke about. Supply chain diversity, supporting local and diverse businesses for our operations. And a commitment to responsible gambling, so ensuring that we continue to support player health and maintain um, those responsible gambling measures set by OLG. Um, and just to highlight some of the outcomes here, um, you'll see that GC Toronto has met majority of those targets. So creating over 2,500 operation jobs to the redevelopment project to date, of which 53% um, identify either as equity deserving or local, 2,700 uh, construction jobs with 30% identifying as equity deserving or local. There was $5 million contributed by One Toronto Gaming to the creation and development of that child care center to the city, uh, which will actually be across the street from the casino with the intent of our staff and also the local community having access to that child care center. And meeting our, proc our procurement target for local spend and creating new avenues to buy from local and diverse suppliers. Uh, and some of the ways that we do this is, you know, hosting supplier diversity events and uh, being members to different non-profit uh, supplier councils. Next slide, please. So some of the lessons learned, I'm, I'm, I mean, there's a lot of lessons, but I tried to <laughs> keep it to three for time. Uh, the first would probably be the need to widen scope. So there was a need for stakeholders involved to leave room for what could work better. And this isn't in regard to targets. It's more about how we can think differently to be successful in achieving the targets that have been set. So for example, a target that we're always working to increase is our local hiring. Um, the official Woodbine uh, local area is that seven kilometer radius that I had mentioned, which includes about four postal codes. But if you've ever been in the area, you know that it's not particularly dense. Uh, so one of the ideas that we've discussed and put forward to the city is to add more postal codes to extend that local area uh, to capture more priority neighborhoods where we're seeing some of those hires. And the city has put this forth as an idea as well. Um, this is something that we're still discussing, uh, but the receptiveness towards the idea is key. The second being the tension that's going to live between outcomes and context. So from a company perspective, um, you're going to have to explain the context and you're going to have to explain it well. And COVID displacement of people and businesses and how it affected employment work is a really great example of what I mean by this. So there were definitely some challenges with post-COVID hiring, um, and this was the reality for a lot of companies. The job market had changed, people had rethought working in service and customer-facing industries, and this type of shift um, is important in conceptualizing the data and the progress of our targets. Um, and this is also how you make room for um, identifying jobs and coming up with solutions, which leads me to my third lesson, the importance of information sharing and communication. So this one seems obvious, but I can't express um, 
yeah. than of how important communication has been uh, for a project as large as this. So I think anyone working on the Rexdale CDA file will attest the level of cohesion it takes to move a project of this size successfully at that. Um, and you know, I think together we all learned that relationship building, information, sh information sharing, and communication both in your organization um, and with external partners is very, very key. Next slide, please. And then looking to the future, the rest of the CBA, um, there's a reflection project being led by the city of Toronto um, that kind of highlights the purpose for the last five years. Um, we're also uh, developing employment and supply chain plans to ensure our company meets the outline targets, and we'll continue to work with the city to pilot new tools to better track and report on that data. Thank you. Beth, uh, an incredible story there. I remember when it came to city council and it was a uh, hard fought. And looks like you had some real good victories there. Excuse me. Yes, I have a couple of questions. It'll be after. Equity deserving. Yes. I don't. Okay, so we used to we used to we used to use a different term. Equity seeking. seeking. Equity seeking groups. Now we use the term equity deserving groups. They deserve, you deserve equity. Okay. You're, not, you're not just seeking it, you deserve it. <laughs> it's, a it's a positive connotation. Yes. That's right. right. You're not asking for anything special. You deserve it. You deserve to be part of an inclusive economy. Okay, to bring it all together, uh, Stephanie uh, Robertson, our third speaker from Social Value Canada. Hi. Um, just so there's somebody working the slides that's magic. I don't know where they are. Okay. I know that in my slide deck there's like eight or nine slides. I'm only going to speak to about four of them, so don't worry if we don't get all the way through. Okay, I don't need to get all the way through. This. Okay, so if you flip to the next slide. Um, oh, next one. Has anyone heard of the concept of social value or heard about a social return on investment analysis? Has anyone? Yeah? Okay. So for those of you who are new to that term, what social value actually means is that we embed an understanding and the value of impact on people's well-being into all of our decision making. So traditionally, what we think of when we're deciding whether or not we're going to spend money or not is we think about cost, right? And if you're building a construction project, it's around the return on investment. That negative value is not included in the return on investment calculation which is one of the reasons why we have so many problems in the world today that we need to solve around environmental, around inequality, et cetera, et cetera. And so the idea of social value is we can upstairs. actually measure and understand yeah, through measurement off. the value of impact on people no, no, no. when we take yes. any kind of action. And that's really what the work that we do at Social Value Canada and I'm going to speak to you in part of today, but if we go to the next slide. Um, so this is the evidence of community benefit that we refer to on the TC, or that is referred to on the, on the TCBN um, uh, website. And you can see local inequity hiring through apprenticeships and also through social procurement, neighborhood environmental improvements. So if we go to the next slide, when we actually, oops, sorry, keep going. When we actually look at all the things that we could actually measure and all the things that we could actually value as impacts that are related to access to meaningful employment, they could be economic, certainly through wages. They also could be health related, physical and mental health related, and emotional health, environmental health, et cetera, et cetera. So there are all these things that we could value, which right now we typically don't even have a way to acknowledge through measurement, let alone value. So I had an opportunity to work with the TCPN on a very small slice of the way that we might think about the value of a community benefits agreement. And if we go to the next slide, um, what we decided to focus on is only the value that is created for community and government at all levels that results from local uh, equity uh, hiring. And I'd love to actually just start my presentation by saying 
that community benefit agreements are such an economic no-brainer, it makes me laugh that we're still talking about them as though they might happen federally, let alone provincially and locally. And I'm just going to give you an example of how we came to that discovery or how we mapped that out uh, in this small project. I think discovery is, a, is not the right word to use because I think it's sort of so self-evident. But really, we still need to spell it out. So, if you go to the next slide. Um, so, within the Metro Lynx Crosstown project, there were opportunities for carpenters, electricians, operating engineers, and also professional administrative and technology roles. What I'm just going to talk about here is the carpenter example only. But we did this for the same for all the other groups. So at the end, the numbers that I share will roll up all of these groups, but this is just the carpenter example. Okay? So you'll see the years go from one to seven. Oops, I'm sorry. One to seven. And so what that really shows is that over time, 25 people were hired in year one. And then in year two, 25 and 11 people were hired. And year three, 20, sorry, 25 people continued to work and 11 new people were offered the opportunity to get into the system as apprenticeship, as apprentices and over time they worked through and became journey people. So at the end of the seven years, you still had 17 people coming in as their first year in an apprenticeship program. You had 17 people who were in their second year, 17 in their third year, 41 in their fourth year, 12 in their fifth, 11 in their sixth, and 25 in their seventh, and so on, okay? Collectively, under that carpenter role, there were 140 people that were offered the opportunity to have meaningful work through the apprenticeship journey uh, process uh, that was represented by the Metrolinx. And so what ends up happening, if you go to the next slide, please, what ends up happening, and you can see, see this information, the numbers are really not that important because I'm going to speak to them now, and I apologize that the numbers are easier to read, but the takeaway slides will be more easily accessed if you want to go into the detail. But at the end of each year, and the numbers here are just for one year, one year of 17 people, 17 people, in that journey that I showed you before. So 140 people are at different stages in their seven year engagement as carpenters in this Metrolinx project, okay? But the people in year one are actually moving from a minimum wage to a wage which is more um, likely to be around $43,000 a year. You know, by the time we reach the end of year seven, the difference in wages that you can see amongst people can be upwards of $99,000 a year. So they would have been earning something before along the minimum wage, which would have been about $29,000, $30,000. The access to this employment opportunity has increased their annual wage by $100,000 a year, essentially, once they go through this apprenticeship process. The reason why all of that is important is that people are paying more provincial tax. They're paying more federal tax. They have more money in their pockets at the end of the day that they can choose to spend in their local community. And people that are part of a demographic or cultural community tend to want to buy things from inside their community. So that could actually be services, food, it could be experiences, entertainment, the main point is that as a person has the opportunity to have this meaningful work, they are generating a whole bunch of economic activity that just follows them throughout that, that process. And so at the end of the Metrolinx process, when you think about carpenters, when you think about electricians, when you think about operating engineers, and you think about the three professional roles, you can actually calculate that the carpenters alone were generating more than $4.2 million worth of wages, which they were bringing back to their local communities, which were obviously priority communities within the city of Toronto, okay? You've got uh, annually just the carpenters alone 
contributing $1.8 million more in provincial taxes. You've got, uh, sorry, that was federal. It was 800,000 provincially. And what we calculated was conservatively, conservatively, in the first four years of their experience as apprenticeships, they were probably uh, spending about $75 more a month on local community goods that they chose to buy. And by the time they finish their apprenticeship, that might be upwards of $250 a month. And so um, that resulted in actually about a, a million and a half dollars by carpenters alone actually being spent and in the local economy, which actually would have an additional multiplier uh, impact that I didn't add those numbers in. Um, oh, I'm getting the wrap up. And you know what kills me is that this is such a good argument, but I need to, to finish. Yes, yeah. exactly. So but really the main point is that community benefit agreements are such an incredible opportunity for the country. And I had the privilege to help run the numbers a bit for the TCBN, and maybe we'll have a chance to talk about that more. Thank you, Joe. Great. Thank you, Stephanie. <clears throat> so the key takeaway there is that when someone comes to you and say, ah, community benefits, they're just going to cost the government money. No, not true. It saves the government money. It makes the governments of uh, the province and the federal government Maybe not the city, but it does make at least those oh, two no, order. Oh, it does the city. City as well. Okay, yeah, city as well. Benefit. Yep. Yep. Okay. So there's a, there's something that you can take in your debates with uh, with colleagues who are resisting community benefits. Okay, we're gonna we have another 15 minutes to go back and forth a little bit. Uh, I'm gonna invite you. We'll probably have a chance for two or three questions, but I'm gonna prime the pump a little bit by asking each of the panelists a single question, and uh, and then that might prime the pump for you to ask your uh, question. Uh, to Varney, give us a story. Tell us a story of a person where including them in the construction of the Finch West LRT has made a difference in their family life and in the life of their community. To Beth, you had a slide there on key lessons learned. Maybe give that one gem that people can take home with them People who maybe are working on the Golden Mile, maybe they're working on a project in their local community, that one thing that they need to know that can sustain them in the journey for community benefits. And thirdly, um, uh, Stephanie, uh, you talked about economic value of community benefits. Can you speak a little bit about the social value of community benefits as well? I know you've done some work in that area. So maybe, and if you could, a minute or two each, and then we'll open it up to uh, questions from the floor. Great. I can tell you a story about a couple instead of one person. Okay. <laughs> okay. So um, we had two couple, you know, uh, not two, two people, a couple who immigrated from Iran in 2020. They're both qualified engineers with ample of, you know, experience, lots and lots of years of experience, and, you know, they're all like masters in engineers, both of them. And when we put together the community internship program, we were doing a lot of um, information sessions in the community. We were talking to uh, different community groups and organizations and job seekers. So these two people, they came through the Labor Education Center and they've showed interest and potential uh, in this program. This was a 12 week learning and training program. It was a training and skills development program for 12 week that uh, Mosaic Transit Group undertook. And we also provided mentorship uh, for the folks. So when these two people you know, came on, on board in 2022, they were already in Canada for two years and they have gone from place to place looking for jobs and no, no doors opened up. And they were both getting very tired of, you know, and also discouraged, demotivated. Um, we prepared them for the interviews for the internship program. They both came through really well with flying colors. They completed the program successfully, and they both got employed in our project. One through the Mosaic Transit Group, and the other through one of our largest subcontractor, Black and McDonald's. So, they're both settled and they're so happy and they do have uh, you know, a child, a whole family settled. 
And today they're giving back to their communities. You know, in their community, there are lots of uh, people who are engineers. If you know Iranians, they are mostly engineers and architects. I don't know. It's uh, inclined towards learning, I think, more math mathematics and physics, I believe. They're giving back to the community by, you know, mentoring uh, other newcomers who are like them. So that was one of our success stories. Uh, honestly, this is going to sound very mushy and <laughs> um, sappy, maybe, but I think you need to have heart. I think that is the one takeaway that I would... Um, I would provide to this group. Uh, I think it's really easy to, you know, look at the numbers, you're focusing on the data, the targets, and, you know, you're kind of far removed sometimes from the actual, um, the ground level work sometimes. Um, and it's easy to kind of just get lost in that. But remembering that, um, remembering why you're doing it and remembering that you're actually affecting people. Like there's really a community that's being affected by the work that's being done. And I think that's uh, that's the biggest takeaway. I think when I did my first um, hiring event, I think it was when I had first started, and you get to really talk to um, the people, the candidates that are coming out looking for these jobs, they're excited. Um, they're, they're asking you questions about the redevelopment project. Um, and you really get a feel for, you know, people are really excited to see what's coming, right? Um, I think that's, that's my biggest takeaway um, uh, that, I could, that I could give you guys. <laughs> Thank you, Beth. Have heart, have heart. <laughs> Stephanie, economic versus social value. So um, m m some of you might, oh, yeah. oh sorry, some of you might uh, already be aware that Canada has declared itself a well-being economy. And what that means, like New Zealand, like Scotland, like a number of other places in the world, it means that the indicators around humans' well-being is equally as important as reporting on GDP, yeah. which basically means you want a productive society but you also want to make sure that the people in their, your society are more satisfied with their overall quality of life. So just actually building on Varney's example, one of the things that you can actually measure is the value of the impact on a person's well-being when they have the opportunity to volunteer or to give to others. And so if you think about the idea of a person having the opportunity to have access to meaningful work, which then not only gives them greater life satisfaction because they have meaning in their work, but they also have resources to devote and give to their community. That's an example of a social impact, impact on their well-being that would be directly equivalent to their ability to give to things that matter to them and to people that matter to them in the communities that they're a part of. We can measure and value that. Thank you. Um, thank you. So let's uh, open it up for some questions and some quick comments. Um, we'll take two or three, and then Kumsa, uh, is he still in the room? I saw him here two seconds ago. He gave me a deadline of 11.25 to get ready for the work first <laughs> workshop. OK, so question. Keep it short to the point, right here. Yeah, um, v very quickly, just um, when we talk about uh, large infrastructure projects like a uh, light rail transit line that has a massive effect on gentrification and displacement in neighborhoods or um, a casino, which we all know has a huge impact on the communities that they're built in in terms of negative impacts, do you think that the community benefits that you've worked on are able to offset that in any way or do you think it's still a, a, a net zero gain in terms of community? We've talked a lot about some of the job opportunities and things, but when we talk about gentrification and displacement from a fixed rail line or a casino, which has massive effects. Well, do you think that the community benefits have helped offset that? And do you think that they've maybe exceeded the impacts on community? Excellent question. Hold on. Next question. Right here. Yes. Gentlewoman. Press the, is the, the lead, oh. red light needs to go on. OK, so um, my question was around um, identity-based data and race-based data. When you think about like the LRT and similarly to the casino project, there's um, a lot of racialized communities around those areas. And I'm very interested in hearing about what that looks like in hiring, like what 
we're seeing for like, for example, the black community in Jaden Finch area or Keelan, Keelan Finch, et cetera. And same with the casino um, project as well. Great, good question, Rates Based Dad. So you, you folks are taking all this in yes. and I'm gonna invite you. Gentlemen. Yeah, if uh, I've also heard examples of uh, newcomers who have skills on the hive, which is great. I'm wondering though, uh, in terms of the projects, the two projects you were talking about, when it comes to people who need to be, don't have the skills yet, the training and getting into apprenticeships, how much of that is happening? Very good. Good question. Anybody else? Questions? Three questions right, right here. A lot of what I'm seeing and hearing is about using the economy that the project is creating, but what about the engagement stage in planning that economy? In particular, the environment seems to continually get short shift. We're calling the friends and allies to support the Atlantic flats. Okay, thank you. It's a particular advocacy campaign going on. Any, anybody else, questions? Okay, I'm gonna give one more right here, right here, yes. Pick, pick, your, pick your red button, thank you. Stephanie had talked about measuring well-being, and I'm just wondering if there are other examples of that beyond your, your case study. Great, thank you. Okay, I'm gonna give each of you uh, uh, a minute and a half, <laughs> and then we'll keep the time. Barney, over to you. The first question. Um, the construction project always comes with a lot of hassle and a lot of issues for the community. It's noise, it's, it's a relocation, people move, they don't want to stay there no more. You know, it, it is a lot and also it affects the business communities. But I feel from my experience how the community benefits offsets such issues and negative impacts in the community differs from project to project. I think and also from location to location. Where, where I am at the Finch West LRT project, we have businesses that are not so close together, as you can see. They are dispersed throughout the alignment. We do our best to create business um, continuity plan. We work with the businesses to ensure what is required, and we work with them on a consistent manner to ensure that they're given the right support to continue and thrive in their businesses. And we also mitigate you know, negative impacts such as noise and vibration and you know, dust and, and, and even traffic, you know, congestion. We try our best to listen to our community and resolve issues as it comes. Community benefits is a new concept to people who are you know, residing along the construction alignment. Uh, that's what I have learned. And the more I go out and I speak to the people, the more they, oh wow, the light bulb goes on. Okay, there is. So, so it's about turning the dialogue uh, around community benefits when we are talking to people who are residing along alignment and talk and really helping them to see that there is opportunity to, to actually better their lives. Um, construction is very short term, right? It's going to finish. Our project is coming to substantial completion by end of this year. So it's going to be done by next year we are in operations. But think about the amount of people it's going to bring to each and every businesses and the plazas that's, that's situated along the alignment. So, you know, you just need to turn the, the dialogue and talk to them more positively and keep them engaged and keep working with them to provide the benefits in a more meaningful way. Thank you, Marty. Let's give her a round. Yes. <laughs> Beth, I think some of the questions were directed in your direction. For sure. I, I'll follow up with that with saying that, you know, it's a part of your question, answering your question is um, really engaging the community and letting them know that this is going to benefit them, right? So I, I do agree. Like, it does. The community, community benefits agreement, it does offset those. Um, those, some of those realities, right? And I'll use the commitment to responsible gam gambling as uh, one of the examples. So um, it, we do have a three-year strategy in place for responsible gambling. Um, and also we've developed a new play smart center as well. We're also equipping our staff with the tools necessary to be able to, you know, there's more people coming into the casino with, you know, we have a massive new uh, gaming floor, right? So we have a lot of new people coming in, people from the community coming in as well. So equipping, equipping our staff with the information and tools in order to, you know, see when uh, players might meet, need some help and there's that stress 
us there um, and making sure that we have those counseling services. So I think the CBA having pieces of that responsible gambling in the CBA definitely does help. So it does offset. Hey, thank you very much. And, and Stephanie. Um, so uh, just to the point about the environmental impact, you know, what I sort of hope is that someday, and I hope someday very soon, that, that all procurers from at a government level will be very clear about the kind of company they want to do business with. So, you know, all companies that are asking or being asked, excuse me, for information by investors are needing to report on their environmental performance, for example, in order to satisfy investor inquiries. I think all levels of government should be doing the exact same thing and maybe doing more as, as leading as opposed to following. So when we're talking about some of the social proportion or social aspects today, I would say Social Value Canada would ad advocate very strongly that we want to have procurement expectations in place that always maximize impact on people and planet. The two are completely intertwined. Um, the, about well-being, um, another example that I'd like to share with you is that there's um, a credit union in Toronto called Duca Credit Union. Maybe some of you have heard of Duca. Yeah. Remember. Oh, right. Okay. Have you heard of the escalator loan? No. No. So the escalator loan has been is a is a is a is a consolidation loan type product that Duca has created for working people achieving or earning an income of somewhere between thirty and seventy thousand dollars a year, and those people, for whatever reason, do not have a credit score that will allow them to access debt or access a regular loan in the mainstream banking system. So they found themselves going out to predatory lenders often, which is a, a long-term, very high-stress relationship, the stress being, for many reasons, partially financial, partially concern, uh, because of the pressure that those interest payments are placing on that household's annual income. And so one of the key indicators that Duca is measuring, they uh, are able to help negotiate that, the end of the predatory relationship and offer their uh, client a better, a much, much, much better interest rate and a, and a fixed term so that there's an end to the debt relationship. One of the biggest impacts on the people that are able to move into an escalator loan relationship is impact on their mental health and levels of anxiety. And so when you are managing or trying to manage an unmanageable level of debt, you tend to have much more likelihood to be anxious, verging on depressed, much more likely to be absent from work or present at work but not really uh, as productive as you might be. So there's all kinds of really important well-being impacts that are going to benefit a person moving into that type of relationship. And the reason why that matters is that ultimately, all loan products need to have some kind of guarantee fund from the government, right? So if you someone defaults on their mortgage, there's a, it's a huge part of what the CMHC would be doing is providing mortgage default risk insurance to those that are providing mortgages. That's a really bad explanation. That's why I'm not working in finance, just so you know. <laughs> but anyway, in an ideal world, what will end up happening through the work that Duca is doing is that the well-being value that's being created for Canadians by moving them from an unmanageable, high-stress relationship with their financial service provider to a much more manageable one, the health, mental health, and other economic benefits from work would contribute to a federal decision to create that loan fund. So that type of financial services product could be much more widely available to people all across the country. So that's that's one example. If you're super interested, there's this presentation in the UK um, a couple days ago, which is an amazing case study, which you can find through the Social Value Canada LinkedIn area, or we'd be happy to send our no or, or I. Yeah. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, that uh, wraps it up. Um, I'm going to give each panelist an opportunity, if they so choose, to say 30 seconds of final wrap-up. 30 seconds. 
Yes, I'm counting. 30 seconds, okay. I would say community benefits program really requires deep commitment from contractors and the ability of, you know, for them to work with stakeholders and the community and listening to them, it matters so much. And having the right people in the job matters too. So I'm all about community benefits and at Finch West LRT, we are all about supporting our communities to ensure that they thrive. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, it's been a great ride being on this project and we're really excited about the future and piloting those new initiatives from the city of Toronto and seeing where, where things head because we have opened up our casino doors and we haven't finished the project yet. Um, it's exciting to see how we can kind of elevate these employment pathways and kind of maybe support the people that we've already hired um, and that are already working at the casino. Um, so we look forward to that and if you guys have any questions, feel free to, you know, reach out or come talk to me after. Thank you. Um, I just want to say that uh, this idea of social value is an international movement. And the slogan for the international movement is, we are changing the way the world accounts for value. And the account for value needs to include impact on people at the center of it as well as impact on the environment and on the financial system. And by thinking about all three types of value in tandem, we'll address inequality and make our world more sustainable.